Welcome back, everybody. My name is TJ Troy. And I'm John Schneider. And we're here to discuss this magnificent contraption. John, what is this called? Believe it or not, it's called Spoils of War. I think that there's a story behind this uh, name, right? At least five. <laughs> okay. But you know, it didn't always look like this, and mm. it's not always going to look like this, because this is actually almost three quarters through its, its evolution. It began, can we spin this? Of course. Let's just look at the back side. Now this is a copy of Harry Parch's original, of course. It began life as a hypo bass, one note only. A marimba key and a resonator. And it had a friend. But, so it looked like that. Harry then attached a wood block to it. Right here. So two big wood sounds, low bass and a high woodblock sound. Exactly. Interesting. Yes, but I got to tell you, it wasn't just any woodblock. This is, this is amazing. He had a special piece of wood he found that did not look like a regular 2x4. It started life as a 2x4, but there was an angle cut on it. Hmm. And he left it on there because he liked the note it gave it. Interesting. And yet it, it, was, it was almost tuned. So that's how it all began. Okay. And then the, the next things that were added were these. These are, in fact, spoils of war, literally, which is where it got the, the title. These are artillery casings. And uh, we'll I was going to say, you, yeah, on the bottom, you can even see the serial number and oh, yes, the yes. caliber. I mean, this is literally uh, a shell casing. It's a shell casing. And they used to be this long. Yeah, and wow. we'll show you in a moment what the originals look like and how we actually made these. Strangely, uh, uh, the sound is quite extraordinary. It goes from low to high. Now that's not very far, that's like a note and a half on the piano. Yeah, maybe. What about all these in-betweeners? Get ready. And that's why they call them microtones, right? <laughs> Can we play them and let them resonate in the room? Just, I already hear there's a collision of sound in your oh. ears, the difference tones, right? Exactly. These instruments are going to produce those difference tones. Can we just let them ring out? Well, actually, I'm going to play you uh, a section of a piece of music that he okay. wrote for this. Uh, he made a, a tune called the Mock Turtle Song. Right. And it starts like this. What an amazing Beautiful. sound. So that's those instruments. And this goes from basically a, a C sharp that's a, about a quarter tone flat up to a D, which is about a third of a semitone sharper than you find on the normal piano. Mm -hmm. So we have the wood sounds, we have the metal sounds, and then comes the glass. These are known as cloud chamber bowls because, in fact, when this had a bottom on it, it was a bottle about that big. 
And back in the 1950s, they actually made cloud chamber experiments by putting inert gas inside mm -hmm. and shooting all sorts of atomic particles through there. And in now, fact, we, we have another film that talks about I was going to say, that. are these not the same bowls that we used for the cloud chamber bowls? Oh, they're the same type. They're not same literally type. the same. Right. Yeah, they, they, were, uh, they were born of the same mother. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> we're not so sure about yeah. the father. So Actually, we do know the father. So I'm Harry saying. probably just found these bowls at a certain point and just loved the sound wanted to use them, but this is just such an odd animal. I mean, we already have two wooden sounds. We have seven metal tones. We have now two glass tones. Oh, yes, yes. And in and fact, there's it more grew coming. from there. All right. He had another rack that he put back here. There were two more cloud chamber bowls, but then it gets really exciting. Okay. He had something called a wang gun. Now, I... If you know what a flexi tone is, it's a yes. piece of spun metal. It's almost like a, what shall we call it? Uh, you know the, the musical saw, mm -hmm. right? That you can bow. If you doing it, it makes this wonderful boing, 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 boing sound. And he had two of them. Uh, there was a bass wang and a tenor wang, mm. and two little pedals here that you could that held onto Control the end. Control the flexion on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so instead it, of bending the flexi tone with your thumb, he's bending it with the pedals on the bass. Exactly. Very cool. Exactly. Very cool. And then he wrote another piece and said, you know, I really want, I want something else. I'm looking for a, that, that scrapey sound. So he added a guido, which mm -hmm. is, of course, a notched gourd with wonderful sound. Right. But he still wasn't done. Uh, you'll also see in the future uh, an instrument called the boo, which was made originally of bamboo tubes. And he mounted two bamboo tongue drums right here. Hmm. And then he stopped, I think because it was going to fall over. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen other photos where he's hanging cymbals off of the rack. There was one piece. One that, piece. That had one, one note. Symbol, of course. And of course he thought to himself, where am I going to put the cymbal? Am I going to have a stand? No. No, 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 no. Because of course one of the joys about Harry Parch's music was not just the music, but the sculptural element of these uh, magnificent instruments. He wanted it to be a feast for the eye and for the ear, and he succeeded completely. I'm so fond of saying it's sort of like walking into Dr. Seuss music land, right? yeah. because these instruments are just all over the place. Were there any other instruments in Harry's collection? We've talked about a few of his instruments together, you and mm -hmm. I, and they all seem to be unified in timbre, tone, even in construction. For example, the cloud chamber bowls are all glass bowls. There's yes. no metal hanging off of that. Mm. The diamond marimba, all wooden marimba all bars. Wood, yeah. This is this contraption of metal, glass, wood, flexitone metal, et cetera, et cetera. Are there any other instruments that are like the jack of all trades, have a little bit of everything hanging off of it? Or well, is this the anomaly? No, this is the most complex one. There's okay. one that has a, a scale of hubcaps Wild. <laughs> and liquor bottles. Okay. So there you go. Uh, there is another glass, all glass instrument. It's called the Mazda. Mazda Marimba, Marimba right. And it's a whole bunch of light bulb casings mm -hmm. with the guts taken out. And from this size, you know, mm -hmm. it's very, very quiet. I'm not quite sure what he, what he was very thinking. Very delicate but, instrument, you know, yeah. You close mic it? Because he, he did use microphones. Listen, way back when he was making the Cathara, that wonderful 72-string pluck string harp, in the, he made it in 1937. By the time he was performing with it, he amplified it. Mm -hmm. uh, now, how, what did that mean way back when? Mm -hmm. Well, he had a, a huge 15-inch Jensen speaker, and he screwed a phonograph pickup to the side of it. I see. That was amplification, not a microphone, right. but a contact mic. Right, contact mic, exactly. Very interesting stuff. Maybe, uh, may I borrow that one a Please. little bit? There's one section, for example, from Daphne of the Dunes or Wind Song that uses these together. To and the player has this up there. And sometimes there's just a stick sound. One thing that we do know about Harry is that because he had a limited set of instruments, he just wrung every possible sound combination mm -hmm. down with it. So he didn't, but he could have. Slightly, there's a little click on the attack, very different from this. 
boy, did he pay attention to his mallets. Sure. And we as modern players have a problem because he would say, use the black mallets. I mean, all we have are his performance scores and, and the person's name who's doing it. Jim, use the blue mallets. Like, it's somewhat part of the percussionist's paradigm, honestly, the, the world that percussion lives within. Because when you get behind the marimba, it's really a monochromatic instrument. It sounds mm. like a marimba. So how do you extract different timbral effects, different tonal effects? It's really through the mallet and then through an extension of the technique, which means that the hand can be manipulated further. So that notion that in his scores he says, you know, use the blue mallet. There's been a lot of composers who've taken that tack and said, well, this is the set of mallets I have. I'm just going to call them by their colors. Mm -hmm. yellow or blue, but what tends to happen is all of those effects change depending on what hall you're in. You know, we're in a big warehouse right now with 30-foot ceilings and it's about 35 feet across, so there's a lot of air in here. Yes. So for example, bass notes like this bass bar are really going to roll out and have a nice bloom mm. inside a room mm. like this. Whereas if we go to my house in my home studio, a bass note like this doesn't even have enough space to really roll out and mm. get that going. Mm. So I'd need to use a different mallet choice in that room for this to speak with any um, notion of accuracy or authenticity of it. With the appropriate amount of air being moved. Yeah, space is important, especially for bass notes and also for higher level transients, because those need to move and bounce off of other things in order to get that glisten inside of our ears. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And then this is gonna be a totally different experience if we're 40 feet away in an audience and in an auditorium that's designed to project sound, as opposed to, like I said, a warehouse space where sound is just scattering all around. It's true. And all of these things are somewhat embedded within the percussionist art form. And Harry, I think, was really intuitive in that, mm. in that aspect. He was you know, not a trained percussionist. Not at all. Yeah. But there's a sensibility that he possessed that I think this is why he's part of the Percussive Art Society Hall of Fame, mm. right? Of course. Is, all of us percussionists recognize not only the gift that he brought to our instrument class with contraptions like this, right? <laughs> and all the other wondrous instruments that he invented and built, but um, the care and attention that he took into how these instruments get performed. Mallet selection, uh, timbral variation, and very smart part writing. You know, we were kind of talking about this previously. The way that he wrote for the instruments seems like he got behind the instruments and improvised these parts and then went back to the table and crafted the part with the yes. way a composer would. So you yeah. see the composer's hand as much as you see the improviser's intuition. And part of that was part of his, his method, his, now they call it his, uh, his practice, his artistic yes. practice. Because oftentimes he would have to train people to play these things. So very early on he was one of the first classical composers to overdub. Because he had to play all the parts. Right. And he did. Right. Yeah, some of those early compositions where he's overdubbing everything. Wind Song was performed like this, is that right? That's correct, yeah. yeah. And this, well, Wind Song, as we know, is a previous version of Daphne of the Dunes. Mm -hmm. And this instrument features heavily within that. It's true. Yeah. It's true. So the repertoire and the instruments are inseparable. And this is going to grow a few more colors because we're moving down the line and we're doing all of his pieces. Eventually, we'll get to the end of the line. So yep. when we meet, need our bass wang and our treble wang, we'll give it the wang it needs. Yeah. Now, how did you source the elements on this instrument? I mean, these are, as we said, these are artillery casings. Where did you find these artillery casings and source them so that we were getting a similar timbral quality, tonal quality that Harry was able to achieve on his instrument? That is a very good question, and thank heavens I put this together during the age of the internet, because yes. otherwise it would have been <laughs> writing letters or wherever else. I can't imagine that. I would order, and the places that, um, you know, there's whole societies that collect World War II memorabilia. Mm -hmm. In fact, the man that made this, Chris Banta, uh, he said, oh, you want some of these? I know where there's hundreds of them, no problem. I said, really, great, and he says, yeah, at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, I shot off half of them. <laughs> Oh boy, and you have to remember when this was made originally, yeah. uh, there war surplus stores mm -hmm. were in every city. Right. You could go in and buy these things, yeah. but now all these 50, 60, 70 years later, they're very rare. 
So I had to write to different uh, different collectors of war memorabilia, and I got some sent that were stainless steel. I gave them the right caliber and the right type, but different materials, so that was different. These are brass, is that correct? These are brass, okay. and high quality brass. Too. And you specifically, we looked for brass because oh, yes. that's the, the quality Harry had, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Right. We're trying to get as close as possible. So the brass is gonna have a vastly different overtone shimmer compared to something like stainless steel. Oh, gosh. I mean, yes. that's, that's why details like this are so vitally important. Um, well, that's very, very cool. What about the glass bowls? Where were those sourced? Same thing. I started shopping around who's got used lab bowls. Okay. And uh, again, it took about two years. Uh, some of the ones that we have for the big cloud chamber bowls right. still have the hash marks on them where they used to fill them up with chemicals. Okay. Well, right. uh, these guys are actually brand new because oh, the Pyrex company see. still makes these these uh, 12 gallon, 16 inch across Pyrex carboys, they're known as. They're not cheap. It was a lot better to get them used. Sure. But uh, nowadays, you know, having had new ones, I like new. Is the sound different at all? Probably. I okay. mean, we have compared because uh, a new one we have in our, in our old set, too. Right. They're all slightly different. But you have to remember that every cloud chamber bowl is, in spite of the fact that it's made out of the same goo, mm -hmm. they pour that stuff into the molds and then pour it out. You have no way of knowing how even the walls are going to be. True. So they have a slightly different overtone structure. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yes, glass is an instrument animal to be making instruments out of. Yeah. It yeah. doesn't behave the same way that metal would and certainly not the way that wood. How about this base bar? This is a two by four, we know that. And right. I'm assuming that's pine. Is it what? Pine. Uh, this is a oh, yes, pine. it is. Yes, it is. We can see this has some. Uh, love bites on it there, divots from where is, uh, the players it's are. It's a softish wood. Yeah. <laughs> How about this bar though? What is this sourced from? You know, I can't even remember. Uh, Chris Banta chose these because Chris Banta makes marimbas of all different sizes with all different kinds of wood from all over the world. Right. Our uh, marimba eroica is made with quarter sawn spruce, as is our base marimba. We're I, using rosewood on the diamond marimba, right. which looks a little bit like the I think this is Paduk, is what this looks that like. That sounds familiar. Yeah. I think you're right. And rosewood is a little bit more difficult to come by these days. To say the right. least. To say yes. the very least, right? It's, it's May I borrow this one more please, time? Please. I have to tell you that this tone in any percussionist that's listening to this, yeah, you could use a softer, but sounds terrible. <laughs> and guess what? So did Harry's. Really? Yes because I've played the original. The resonance is there, it's right. 55 hertz. You know, when you apply those principles, similar to what we've talked about on the marimba eroica, mm. when you're right on the dead center of the bar, that's a nodal point, a point of no of course, vibration. Of course. And so you can actually produce a tick and you can do it on purpose. So there if you're that's getting the a color lot, you want. You're getting a lot of attack quality, right? And you're getting a pop. But if you come off center with that, there you're hearing more of that bass and that almost sounds like a gourd buzz. The resonator's doing so much work yeah, on exactly. that. Um, yeah, for this pitch, for this frequency, this bar is very undersized, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. It's very, very small for but it. But in the name of authenticity, right. we went for the original yeah. and that's the exact sound that he got. So. It's like if you listen to a Mozart uh, sonata played on a forte piano, mm -hmm. it's not the same as a nine foot four Mason and Hamlin modern concert grand. Right. And that's fine because he, Mozart wrote for that instrument, the forte piano. He mm -hmm. did not write for a future instrument. Mm -hmm. So when we reproduce the music, we're going for this exact same color. And there it is. He did want a stronger A and he made one on the marimba eroica. Right. And that bar is that wide, it's that thick, and it's that long. Yeah, right. And the resonator isn't even a tube, it's a cavern. Exactly, exactly. So there we are. Yeah. Well, this is such a fascinating contraption, and I think the name of it, the spoils of war, sort of suits the eclectic and eccentric quality. <laughs> I think it kind of speaks a little to Harry's sense of humor, 
you know, that seems to permeate throughout everything that he wrote, yeah. you know, and um, certainly the, s the visual sculptural spectacle of this, I think that's one thing that has always attracted me to Harry's work was the visual aesthetic that these mm. instruments served. These are sculptures, right? And the ideal, of course, would be to have a room, the instruments can stay set up, and they can behave as sculpturals, more as an installation, right? Mm. Um, I'm really thankful that Chris was able to design for us this instrument that is road ready. We can take this apart, it goes into cases, and we can go out on the road to share this music with audiences in other cities. Which is the huge difference between Harry's original instruments. He yes. built them for what they were and to deal, and he wasn't thinking that far down the road. He built these huge monoliths, really, mm -hmm. and yeah. they didn't break down. And that's exactly right. That's what the Parch Ensemble has done. We've redesigned these in such a way they pack up and they can come to you. You don't yeah. have to come, <laughs> come to it. Right. Well, John, this has been really fascinating. I really appreciate you sharing all this with us. My pleasure. Right There'll on. be plenty more because there's more instruments to come. Stay tuned, folks, and thanks again for stopping by.